A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I'm glad you're with me on the program today. We are going to be talking about what's going on in New Mexico. We've got a a lot of developments here over the past 24 hours, including uh, an actual court hearing, which is scheduled for this afternoon. A uh, number of cases on the docket of the uh, U.S. District Court judge overseeing these challenges. And uh, who knows? We may even get a ruling from the bench. I don't think we will, but I suppose it's still a a possibility that uh, by this afternoon, Governor Michelle Luan Grisham's emergency order suspending the right to bear arms in Albuquerque and Bernalillo County will have been officially undone by the courts. Before we get to the uh, latest, though, let's talk about this. Biden's America is crushing us. You've got companies laying off tens of thousands of workers one after the other. Americans working two jobs just to get by. Inflation pushing hardworking families to the brink. Just look at the price of lunch for me next time you go to the grocery store. And a digital dollar could be coming down the pipeline to completely destroy our way of life. The truth is, you need a plan. You know it, and I know it. And that is why you should call Gold Co. So you can diversify your savings and investments with gold and silver before things get worse. They're a six-time Inc. 5000 winner, 2022 Company of the Year, with thousands of five-star reviews. And they've helped people like you and me place over $1 billion in gold and silver. They're offering up to $10,000 in free silver while supplies last. And if you call them today, qualified callers will get a free Ronald Reagan half-ounce silver coin. So don't wait. Call Gold Co. at 855-412-3806 today. That's 855-412-3806. So, again, number of developments over the past 24 hours uh, in the land of enchantment. Uh, you've got the Attorney General of New Mexico, Raul Torres, uh, publicly saying he will not defend Governor uh, Michelle Luan Grisham's uh, emergency order suspending the right to carry, calling it unconstitutional. Uh, and uh, this was an interesting catch. Ed Morrissey over at Hot Air uh, found this uh, quote in the Santa Fe, New Mexican, where a spokesperson for the New Mexico State Police says that they have not issued any citations. Now, remember, Governor uh, Grisham said earlier this week that those folks who had attended that uh, Second Amendment rally in Old Town Albuquerque this past weekend, oh, they were going to be getting citations in the mail. Apparently not. Nope, not according to the state police spokesperson. So that does beg the question, who exactly is enforcing the governor's order? (laughs) As well as who's going to defend it in court uh, this afternoon? All very... Good questions, and I'm not sure that uh, the governor has any good answers right now. But we've got another question. What happens after the governor's order is struck down or enjoined by the courts, as I expect is going to be the case? It, there's a Look, there's a possibility that uh, the judge in this case could, could play some games, could say, uh, you know, I just don't really think that these plaintiffs have standing because they've not been able to show... Uh, any real threat of enforcement here. So unless they are, you know, truly going to uh, run afoul of this order, uh, and there's no sign that they are, given that no one's enforcing this, eh, they don't really have a legal leg to stand on. We've seen that before. Saw that out of a, a case of con- in Connecticut challenging a ban on carrying in state parks. Uh, the federal judge in that case, Judge Janet Bond Arterton, uh, basically ruled that there's no sign that this law has ever been enforced, and uh, so there's no real threat of arrest or prosecution. Um, so, not going to throw out the law, going to keep it in place. And I guess you know maybe if you get arrested for carrying, then uh, come back and and uh, file another lawsuit after the fact. I would hate to see the judge in this case pull a similar dodge to avoid a direct ruling on the judge's order, but uh, I will say that that is a possibility. Um, even if that happens, the fact remains that this order is not being enforced, that Democratic lawmakers, Democratic officials from the attorney general on down, everybody but the governor, it seems at this point, has said that this is unconstitutional. So then the question becomes, what happens next? If, if this order cannot be enforced or is not being enforced, If the order is struck down by the courts, where does the governor go from here? She's not going to fold up her tent and go away. We know that. 
I'm starting to see some signs here that maybe uh, the governor's fellow Democrats and even some law enforcement officials may be willing to offer her a political life preserver here. In his comments on Wednesday, the Attorney General, uh, Raul Torres, um, talked about uh, urging the governor to consider whether her time would be better spent on developing comprehensive legislation. Meanwhile, CBS News reports the New Mexico Chiefs of Police Association said every law enforcement officer in the state shares Luan Grisham's concerns about gun violence, but the order was the wrong way to go. The association, quote, will join others in calling for a special legislative session to tackle gun violence, said the group's head, Farmington Police Chief Stephen Hebby. Now, it's worth noting that uh, Hebby also told CBS News that, quote, the knee-jerk reaction to curtail the rights of every citizen rather than focusing on lawbreakers who plague our communities can't be justified. Um, that, that's a good thing to hear, right? That, that suggests that the Police Officers Association or the Police Chiefs Association would not endorse the type of gun control uh, policies that the governor has been calling for. But the governor's also been talking about a special session for several months. I mean, she hasn't said anything lately. But during the regular session, when it became clear that uh, her fellow Democrats were not going to advance her anti-gun proposals, remember, she had called for a ban on so-called assault weapons, raising the age to purchase any firearm from 18 to 21. She wanted a 14-day waiting period on all firearm transfers in the state. Her fellow Democrats said no to all of those things. And she had threatened to bring them back to Santa Fe for a special session. But when it became clear that... Again, the interest wasn't there. She backed off those calls. Well, again, now we're starting to hear, oh, maybe we need a special session. Maybe we should have a special session. Hey, Governor, maybe you should focus on legislation rather than executive action. It does make me think that uh, I don't think, I, listen, I don't think the governor's playing some sort of 4D chess here. I, I think this was a political miscalculation for her to issue this order. And I think she did so believing, expecting, but not knowing that she would have the support of people like Raul Torres or the sheriff in Bernalillo County or the DA, uh, none of which materialized, right? Instead, they all came out in opposition to what she was talking about. But as a face-saving measure, um, could the governor call for a special session once her order has been struck down, saying, fine, I can't go it alone, fine, the courts won't let me, the radical Supreme Court is standing in the way of these common-sense gun laws, so... Instead, I'm going to, you know, ask the uh, lawmakers to go back to Santa Fe and we're going to do this together. Yeah, I think it's a distinct possibility. Now, again, I don't know that it guarantees that her gun control agenda is going to fare any better in a special session than it did during the regular session. In fact, I would say that uh, the governor's lost a lot of political capital over the last week. Uh, when you have Democratic fellow Democrats in the legislature, who are speaking out saying, hey, what you're doing is unconstitutional. She's not really putting herself in a position of leadership on this issue, right? Because if you listen to the governor, well, you're probably going to end up infringing on people's rights. But I am concerned that those Democrats may give a second look to some of the things that she was talking about. None of which, by the way, would uh, curtail or derail or impact violent criminals in Albuquerque banning the sale of so-called assault weapons, the most commonly sold rifle in the country, rifles in the country. Now, criminals primarily use handguns in the commission of their crimes, right? So banning one type of firearm isn't going to impact criminals. Raising the age to purchase a firearm from 18 to 21, is that going to stop criminals from illicitly acquiring firearms? Absolutely not. Is it going to prevent young adults from being able to access their Second Amendment rights to self-defense? Absolutely it will. 14-day waiting period, same thing. Criminals aren't getting their guns through legal means to begin with. But imposing a two-week waiting period on anybody who wants or needs a firearm for personal protection is going to have a negative impact on public safety. Again, I don't know that these proposals would fare any better in a special session, and it might actually give Republicans the opportunity to put forward uh, proposals. I shouldn't say just Republicans. You might even see some Democrats say, all right, listen, we're going to take a different route. We, we agree that violent crime is a problem. We disagree that it's the fault of law-abiding gun owners, that, uh, that tackling uh, and, and, and you know, trying to infringe on their rights is somehow going to 
uh, be of great public safety benefit. So instead, we're going to focus on the violent criminals like we should be. I think there is the opportunity to do that if a special session is called. Uh, But again, a lot of this depends on how willing legislative Democrats are to go toe-to-toe with the anti-gun governor. I think it's more likely than it was a few weeks ago. And like I said, I think she's lost a great deal of political capital uh, since issuing her order. But even if this order is struck down, gun owners... We can take a moment to celebrate, but uh, you better get back on guard because she's not going to give up. She's not going away. And I think she might uh, use that lifeline that she's been offered from some of these uh, groups and individuals uh, talking about the need for a special session to do just that, to bring lawmakers back to Santa Fe and try to impose more infringements on the right to keep and bear arms, this time through the legislative process. We, of course, will be keeping our eyes on everything that's going on in New Mexico at BarryAndArms.com. I encourage you to check out the website uh, throughout the day. We'll give you all of the details as they develop. Right now, let's turn our attention to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. We will uh, start there. Case out of Santa Clara County, California, you know, the uh, home of now former Sheriff Lori Smith, who was uh, convicted in a civil trial of bribery and corruption charges for a pay-to-play scheme for concealed carry. Basically, if you wanted a concealed carry permit, you had to uh, uh, cough up some cash or prizes to the uh, sheriff's office or maybe uh, the sheriff's re-election campaign or a third-party campaign supporting her re-election. I want to make sure I get that right. Since the sheriff's resignation, we've seen the Bruin decision come down. The May issue laws in California have uh, gone away, although they've now been replaced by SB2, the carry killer legislation. The new sheriff in Santa Clara County says he's making progress in issuing concealed carry licenses, although there have only been a couple of dozen that have been issued to date, and there are about 900 applications in the pipeline. Meanwhile, what happens if you're legally carrying a gun in Santa Clara County and you illegally shoot somebody, not in self-defense, but in an offensive fashion? Well, the answer is not much. Here's a headline. Mountain View Man takes plea deal following 2021 gang-related shooting at Ringsdorf Park. Defendant pleads no contest to one felony and two misdemeanors for gun incident. Now, the felony plea, as well as the two misdemeanors, will not result in a great amount of time behind bars. According to the Mountain View Voice, 21-year-old Ronaldo Medina is a sentencing in Santa Clara County Superior Court next month. Uh, independently, judges sentencing Medina could serve between 90 and 180 days in county jail as well as three years of formal probation, also eligible for a, quote, in-custody and out-of-custody jail alternative. So he might not have to go to jail at all, even though, again, he pleaded no contest to shooting somebody back in September of 2021. According to authorities, the incident occurred back on September 15th of that year. One of the victims said he came to the park, saw Medina hanging out by the basketball court, said hello, and Medina pulled out a gun. Victim told police in a statement that he attributed the hostility to the different gang affiliations. Then two of the victim's friends saw what was going on. They ran over to help. Medina then hit the victim on the head with a handgun, causing a gash. Medina started to run away. The other guy started chasing him. Medina then stopped, turned around, fired a single shot, uh, hitting one of the men in the leg. Medina then ran towards an apartment complex. The other men ran in the opposite direction. When police arrived on the scene, they spoke with the victims and witnesses who provided descriptions of Medina. First victim had recognized Medina from an earlier incident when several gang members had fired at his car the previous month. Yeah. But he was arrested the next day without incident. He actually came to the Mountain View Police Department to retrieve his dog, which had been reported stolen earlier in the week. And so here you got a guy who, again, please, no contest to this. There's eyewitness testimony, not only from the victims, but from uh, third parties who testified, yep, that was the guy. Yep, he fired the shot. Yep, hit the guy in the leg. And he still is able to cop a plea deal. Uh, Mountain View Voice says, uh, for Mothers Against Murder, the nonprofit victims advocacy group based in Los Altos, the plea bargain is too little, too late. Margaret Petros, executive director of the group, says it took two years to conclude. So back and forth, wasting public resources on law enforcement, millions of dollars when there's a way to be efficient. She also found the delays, uh, quote, particularly perplexing given the high degree of cooperation that occurred in the investigation of the shooting. Case documents show that police officers spoke with Medina, two injured victims, several bystanders who witnessed the event, and their statements all confirmed the basic details of the shooting. Following the arrest, Medina actually arranged for police to recover the handgun, which he left with a friend for safekeeping. Uh, after the shooting, police officer found a, a shell casing for a 40 caliber bullet. Uh, when questioned by police, Medina said he fired the gun towards the ground as a scare tactic to deter the men from chasing him, added that he did not intend to hurt anybody. 
Also claimed that one of the men chasing him had a gun in his waistband, which he flashed when he lifted up his shirt. Police never found this person, but a jogger in the park said he saw the altercation from a distance, and it appeared that another man had a gun as well. Of course, again, even in that case, Medina was the initial aggressor, right? Um, you could maybe make the case that uh, Medina was, I don't think he can make a good case that Medina was firing in self-defense when he ran away. At that point, he had already committed a battery. And Medina, was he in you know legitimate fear of his life or great bodily harm? If he was, it was only because he had just attacked somebody. So while California, again, is cracking down on lawful gun owners with SB2, making it impossible to carry almost everywhere in the state, raising taxes on firearms and ammunition, what's going on? Again, with admitted gang members who are shooting people. They're copping plea deals. They're getting slaps on the wrist. They may not even go to jail at all after shooting someone. Now, I don't know about you. <laughs> that seems awfully backwards, doesn't it? Seems like maybe it should be the violent criminals who are getting the consequences and the lawful gun owners who are able to protect themselves. But uh, nope, I guess in Topsy Turvy, California, it's the other way around. And today's Armed Citizen story from Georgia, where uh, you do have the right to act in self-defense, as well as in defense of another. Uh, an armed bystander stopped in an attempted robbery at a uh, fast food restaurant, Zaxby's, in uh, Alpharetta, Georgia. According to authorities, a 57-year-old man tried to rob the manager at that Zaxby's in Alpharetta. But a man who had just pulled in to order some food had a gun of his own. Uh, Shamira Bates told Fox 5 in Atlanta, I'm glad somebody was there to help the people who could have been a victim. The attempted armed robbery happened around closing time Sunday night. Police said as the manager was leaving, an armed man approached him in the parking lot and tried to rob him at gunpoint. Alfred, a police lieutenant, Andrew Splon, told uh, Fox 5 in Atlanta, an independent witness observed the robbery in progress and intervened in the robbery and shot the suspect after the suspect pointed his firearm at the witnesses and the victim. When police arrived on the scene, they set up a perimeter to search for the suspect who had fled into the uh, woods nearby. They uh, did locate him. Found uh, two bullet wounds to his leg. Suspect uh, taken to the hospital, now facing a number of charges, including armed robbery, aggravated assault, as well as possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. The uh, armed citizen who defended that store manager, now not facing any charges at all. Finally today, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing, a police officer in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, who was able to save the life of a child. This is a, a screen grab from the uh, dash cam of this officer's car. You can see him working on this uh, young child. Happened uh, Thursday morning, last Thursday, uh, or actually, I guess, August 31st, so a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Zare Brown, it's a child's name, stopped breathing early that morning. Parents started driving to the hospital, and uh, as they were on the way, speeding, uh, Officer Robert Baer uh, was in the area. Father saw the uh, car got out of his vehicle, waved down the officer, told him what was going on, and uh, Robert Baer started performing CPR on the uh, young boy. Zaire began breathing, but when Baer picked him up, he said his eyes rolled into the back of his head. He said, that's why I sent him back down. He wasn't breathing again. So I started chest compressions again, and once he came to, he started breathing again. At that point, firefighters and paramedics had arrived on scene, and they were able to uh, render more aid. Um, the officer and this young child reunited a couple of days ago. Uh, Bear got to hold Zare once again once he was out of the hospital and uh, on his way to recovery. Bear said, thinking about my own son, wanting to go home, just grab him, you know, make sure he was okay. Coming back here tonight, he said, and is a, a good thing. Marshall Brown, Zare's mother, calls Officer Bear her son's angel on earth, and it is hard to dispute that. Again, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing to save the life of a child. Officer uh, Robert Bayer there in uh, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. We thank you very much for your very, very good deed. That is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company, but I want to thank you for being a part of the program as always. Looking forward to being back with you again tomorrow. We're going to be talking more about New Mexico. Actually uh, going to be talking with a uh, firearms instructor about how the governor's order has impacted the number of folks who are trying to get a concealed carry license in the state. 
Look forward to uh, that conversation. Be sure to check out BarryAndArms.com throughout the day. Again, we've got you covered on all of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation. And if you like what you see, I'd encourage you to become a VIP or VIP Gold member as well. Just go to BarryAndArms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS, and you can get a significant savings on your VIP or VIP Gold membership. As R of saying, thanks for showing your support. We're going to give you exclusive content you won't find anywhere else. New stories and analysis that matter. Just like your backing. So thank you again. All right. Enjoy your hump day Wednesday. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.